Are you the author of your own life story? That's the topic of today's interview with coach, mentor, and entrepreneur Doug Holt on today's episode of the Freedom Club Podcast. Welcome to the Freedom Club Podcast, where we discover the fight for freedom, fulfillment, passion, and purpose. Your host is Kurt Mercadante, Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, an agency founder who is dedicated to coaching individuals seeking to level up their life and their businesses. The Freedom Club is about unlocking your talents, turning them into strengths, and crushing your objectives. You can learn more at KurtMercadante.com. Welcome to the Freedom Club. And happy Wednesday, everyone. It's time for the interview segment of the Freedom Club podcast. I'm your host, Kurt Mercadante. So happy you are here today. It is Thanksgiving week. So perhaps you're listening to this podcast while you're in the car on the way to grandma's house. And if that's so, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving, wonderful weekend. Spend that time with your family, your friends, your loved ones. And this week, again... I'm thankful for you, thankful for you listening, thankful for you referring this podcast to your friends, family, and colleagues, because that's how we have grown week after week after week, our audience growing around the world. And you're going to enjoy today's interview. It's with coach, mentor, and entrepreneur Doug Holt, who, my friends, is living a life of freedom. He's got a great background from fitness to a internet agency to what he's doing now. He's speaking, he's presenting, he's coaching, and he's helping business owners get out of their own way, get unstuck, and helping people to be the author of their own life story. So without further delay, here's my interview with coach, mentor, and entrepreneur, Doug Holt. Cool. Well, we are here with Doug Holt. Doug, thank you so much for being here and coming on the Freedom Club podcast. Oh, so excited to be here, Kurt. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. We're, we're probably in, uh, as t- in terms of climate, uh, two very different places. It's about 70 degrees and sunny here in Europe in uh, what I assume is biting cold of New England. It is. It is. My wife, uh, I always say, dragged me here. I'm from Southern California. So uh, Santa Barbara, California was the coldest place I'd lived. And uh, you travel a lot, but now here I am right by the ocean, but with snow falling down as we speak. <laughs> it's funny. We, we moved here, you know, I, I, I'm from Chicago area. And um, I was not one of those people who's like, it's Chicago Bears weather, get down and love it. I just never grew to love it. And so now that we're here, this is kind of the first year where I'm not having to travel a lot up north with my agency clients. And so I would always kind of time things not only around meetings, some god awful meetings and some other things, but traveling up north, I would start to experience the cold and the Christmas decorations and all that. So it felt, this is the first year where no, I'm just in hot climates. And the only place I traveled to was Egypt where it was like 105. (laughs) And so like Friday, someone was like, happy Thanksgiving. I'm like, what? (laughs) Yeah, next Thursday. I'm like, really? It's like, that's crazy. Like I I just completely lost my frame of reference. Um, But I'm sure you're feeling very holiday-ish right now with the weather. <laughs> I don't know if holiday-ish is the way I would say it, but um, it's, it's definitely different. And I love the uniqueness that it's bringing uh, to the table, which is fun. My, my son loves playing in the snow. Uh, so that's great. Well, Doug and I met, we're both members of a, uh, for lack of a better term, online mastermind type group uh, called 10X Factory. And Doug and I are both in there. We're both uh, fans of each other's content. At least Doug says he's a fan of mine, but yeah, no, no. So we're both fans of each other's content. And Doug's a coach, mentor, and entrepreneur. And so Doug, the first question I always ask my guests is, what does the word freedom mean to you? You know, the word freedom means to me the ability to make choices in my life that allow me to what I call be the author of my own own story and puts me in the driver's seat of my own destiny. That's awesome. And, and you mentioned, because uh, I said, where are you located? But you said right now, New England. I mean, you have added a bit of, free- well, a lot of freedom to your life. We'll talk about that. But uh, you're nomads, right? For lack yeah, of effectively. Yeah. We'll lease a place for a year. You know, we were actually in Bend, you know, I said Santa Barbara's coldest place, but we were in Bend, Oregon for two years. Um, we're thinking of planting roots there and then 
got in. We have a, a sprinter van that we, that I can, well, we converted okay. and uh, one of these four by fours. And so it's an office place. So we drove across the U S and Canada and landed here for a wedding in Vermont. And, uh, you know, as I told you offline, it's, I have a lot of speaking engagements booked that I'll be doing as far as conferences and things and turned to my wife and said, Hey, you know, six months is going to be crazy. Where in the world, anywhere in the world you want to live, you know, I'm thinking she's going to say New Zealand, Costa Rica, Hawaii. Uh, so here I am in York, Maine, a stone's throw from the beach. It's beautiful, but not what I expected. <laughs> well, so, so let's kind of reverse engineer it. How did you get to this point? I know you had an agency, you were involved in fitness. So how did Doug get to Freedom Doug of today? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and so I'll take you back to my 20s um, when I'm in my 40s now. So in my 20s, uh, I owned three businesses and I've always been entrepreneurial even as a kid and just who I was. So I owned a private training studio in downtown Santa Barbara. This is before that was really a business model in the marketplace. Physical training. Physical, yeah, yeah. we torture people. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I always say, yeah. People would pay us high dollar to torture them. Uh, so I had a private training studio. On the second floor, I ran a fitness magazine and then I did consulting, so marketing consulting. And so I was doing those. So the whole idea of your early 20s, grind it out, work hard, you know, be successful. And uh, I'll, I'll explain why I'm saying this, but yeah. all my clients that were coming in were usually multimillionaires, very successful businessmen and women, uh, as well as celebrity clients. And so, you know, if they say you come to some total of the five people you spend the most time with, well, I was spending time with all the time with some of the most successful people in the world uh, coming in and out. So it was amazing. And I had a mentor, a very famous businessman was a mentor. Mine was a client too. And I would talk to him about what I wanted to do. I want to travel. I want to do these things. And he sat me down one day. He said, Doug, you can't, you, that's impossible. Like I've been around the block. I know, you know, politicians and all these people. Uh, the life that you want, which now we call digital nomads kind of, and <laughs> back then it wasn't, but it doesn't exist. So, you know, you, you own a business, your youngest business owner on State Street in Santa Barbara. You own a gym. You're living your dream life. You know, everybody wants to trade with you. You know, just be happy, suck it up, and enjoy the moment. And, uh, Kurt, you know, that was one of those things, my, you know, I thought, wow, this guy is ultra successful. And, and you would know, you've used a lot of his pro, pro, you know, products, I'm sure. So I'm thinking, man, I'm just, you know, maybe I'm just stupid. Like, maybe I'm just, something in the pit of me just felt like, like there was more. And uh, I remember sitting at a coffee shop, I grabbed my journal. I was very much into journaling and uh, same coffee shop in Santa Barbara. I would meet my mentor. And uh, for those, anybody listening that goes there, uh, you'll know exactly the places I describe it. But I opened my journal, was the first one there, have my cup of coffee and I write a question. Go, Are you happy? And the answer came back. I was like, crap. The answer is no. You know, here I am, I, I literally have these people who are multimillionaire celebrities like telling me that I have the dream. I'm living the dream. I wish I would have done it like you, Doug, but I'm not fulfilled or happy. And Kurt, I asked myself another question. This will all tie back into how I got where I am. As I wrote a question, you know, I'm traveling and I'm backpacking, so I'm doing some fun things. And I wrote a question down. I was like, you know, if someone followed me around for the last two years of my life, like the real stuff, you know, like when you get off work and you go home and no one sees you and for me, what it was at that time in my life is I needed to wind down. So I'd pour a couple cocktails. I was single and I wouldn't go out, you know, turn on a movie, shut the world out, curtains, you know, the whole nine. Sure. If someone followed me around and wrote a book about my life, would it be a bestseller? Again, answer in the journals, no. I'm like, crap. <laughs> you know, this is not looking good. But I'm being honest with myself. And then I asked, okay, great. Well, would this be a book that I would want to read? And again, the answer is like, no, it wouldn't be a page turner for me. And so that's where I started writing like, wow, you know, I really believe you can write your own story every single day. I really believe you wake up, it's yours. Your choice is yours. The choice for you and I to engage and for me to, to, to read your content. Those are choices we make. And that's why I started coming back. I was like, man, yes, I am living the dream. And this was my dream, but it's no longer my dream. I am, just, I am trapped by this success that I'm having at a young age. I am trapped by this uh, and the accolades. and I'm. I'm not satisfied. I am no longer the author of my story. Somebody else has got the pen. And it's kind of that, that same idea of, you know, what do you want? And if you say, I don't know, then somebody else is going to fill in that blank for you. They're going to they're gonna design your life. Um, so that's when I planned on exiting my business, my training studio. I ended up selling it. 
um, and moving everything online and started really living life by my design. And I wake up and I plan it out. What do I want to do in business? You know, five key areas for me, mind, body, soul, relationships, and business. And, you know, life's short. I've had way too many people younger than I, you know, healthier than myself, you know, leave this planet uh, way too early uh, to be just grinding it out and not being satisfied. And so that really is what that question, am I the author of my own story or someone followed me around that sparked this adventure? It's interesting because you talk about you know, whether it's being the author of your own story and, and, and you talked about choice. Mm-hmm. And that, that realization that every single one of us were autonomous human beings, unless you want to be, you know, have some invisible puppeteer pulling your strings. And often that puppeteer isn't anyone. It's not a specific person. It's your limiting beliefs. And when you talk about choice, it can be exhilarating because you realize I am the author of my own story. And what do I want that story to be like? But it can also be damn scary too, right? Because you realize you're responsible, you're accountable. Do you find that, and, and I know I certainly have, that there are some people who would rather not realize they have a choice because it can be easier, right? Even though you're more miserable, I call it a comfort zone of misery. It can be easier to, to, to act like you don't have a choice and just blame everything on the world, right? Victimhood. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what's interesting in our society, in our culture, a lot of times, the more I complain to you about my life, the more attention you're going to give me, yeah. right? Oh, Doug, it's okay. And now I'm going to get fulfilled some level, you know, whether it's a feeling of love, satisfaction, significance, you're now going to come to my aid and now we're going to connect over my misery. Um, and probably with most people now, I know not you cause you're a great coach and I've read your stuff, but most people will say, Oh Doug, it's all right. And then you'll start sharing into my misery. And now we're in this, this cycle of talking about how bad things are rather than, Hey, I'm not going there. I'm not playing. Don't pull me in. Yeah. That codependency can be so dangerous and so easy to fall in because it's, it's like, Oh, I got to do something for them. I have to be compassionate. It's like, well, focus on the outcomes, not the inputs, right? You yeah. know, do you actually want to save their life or do you want to become part of their problem and continue? Yep. Uh, it's just like with addicts. And I've had members of my family where people feel bad for them and they continue to enable them. And it's like, you're not helping them. You're making it worse for them and you. And um, so, yeah. So, um, that, well, I think also if I can real quick sure. is it, cause this is, I think this is such a big thing that I wish somebody would have grabbed me early on in my life is I had the habit. I don't know if you do this, but and I, I'm definitely better than I used to be. I am the biggest work in progress <laughs> ever. Um, <laughs> we all but, should be right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think so. I think that's how you get better, right? You get yeah. past the teenage stage of your learning. When you know everything you're screwed, right? right. That's your teenager years um, in any business or any aspect of life. But, um, what I used to do is I would, what my wife calls this, my wife is really smart is I would dim my light to let others shine brighter, right? If someone was feeling bad, I'm very empathetic. I'll go there and I'll, I'll play down my success. I'll play down who I am to make them feel better about themselves. And I, and that was the wrong thing to do, right? Cause I, I gave them, you know, what my wife actually was the one that pointed it out to me. She's like, you're giving them permission to play small. Yeah. That's right. a disservice to them. Like if you're really doing this to, to show them love because you care, then show your light, show them, the, show them something different and just be yourself. And so when I started authentically just not dimming my light, just being who I am, what I noticed is those people around me who start complaining, their complaints would fall in deaf ears and that gave them permission to step it up. Sure, they can complain. I complain all the time. We all do, right? But it gave them permission to step into a greater power that they already knew they had inside them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some people will react that way and some people will just fold, but there's yeah. nothing necessarily that we can do about that. Uh, yeah. if, if you're not their coach or, you know, um, so, so you had this epiphany mm-hmm. that you want to be the author of your own book and you're still in your twenties, you're successful, but the answers to those questions you asked weren't the right answers. So what happens next? Yeah. Well, the, 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 I don't know if they weren't the right answers, but they were, the answers that came back to me, I know it's semantics, but the answers that, that came back to me really surprised me. You know, I knew it, but I didn't, you know, was it, I was 
I was hiding from myself at this point. And I've been doing, you know, personal development and business development since my teenage years, right? I just have, I've always been attracted to bettering myself and people around me. Um, so what I did then is I kind of closed my journal. I thought, okay, well, first of all, I went through probably 48 hours of depression, <laughs> you know, not clinical depression, but feeling a bit down, right? The reality here. And then I chose just, look, this is, this is the truth. Don't lie to yourself. What's the path forward? And the struggle that I had internally was I have all of these people who are really successful over here telling me that, you know, I'm living this dream lifestyle. And then I went back and started thinking about who these people are. Because remember, I was working with these people three, four days a week. I knew them better than their spouse knew them at that point in their life, by far, better than anybody. Because people will tell you anything about themselves to avoid getting tortured, right? I used to, <laughs> I used to call it torture. They yeah. just will. And you have that camaraderie. And plus, these people are so successful. You know, they were worried about other people taking advantage of them or they were leaders. And so I was their confidant. I was their friend. What I realized then was, wow, these people are amazingly successful, but their marriages aren't good. Not always, but their health isn't good. You know, that's one of the reasons a lot of them were seeing me. They had sacrificed these areas of their life. So then I set on a quest of how do I build this? How do I find mentors, right? I've always had coaches and mentors as you have and as you are for so many people. And who is doing this now? You know, what the life that I want to live, you know, traveling, teaching, but also running multiple businesses at the same time. Because I wasn't willing to, you know, what I felt was sacrificing at the time, wasn't willing to sacrifice that part of myself. And I couldn't find one person. So I started really following a multiple people and started taking little bits and pieces that worked for me out of what they were doing and how they were living their lives. You know, and then I started putting those pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah. And that's when I started making big leaps, you know, into my, my business career, but also putting myself in a position of, of exiting. And the exit wasn't overnight. I didn't go, hey, I'm closing the doors. Thanks for coming. Um, I did a transition rollout for about two years. And so you had, you had your the fitness business that you were doing mm -hmm. somewhere along the line. Was it at that same time that you built up the agency kind of as this was going on or did you exit then build the agency and then. So, but I, I've been doing consulting, so I'll go back even further. <laughs> so back in the late nineties, I was hired by an internet company and I was senior in college and I got hired on full time. This is the bubble, right? Sure. Uh, you know, coming up. Um, so I had started doing marketing and marketing consulting really early. Because if you knew anything back then, you knew more than most people. And being young, so coming out of college at 21, 22, um, doing internet business was easy for me because no one knew your age. And it was almost an advantage to be younger, right? So I was always doing that, but it was always kind of a side gig. Hmm. And so during this two-year period, that's when I scaled the agency. So I switched it. It used to be just me, Doug Holt, right? Um, then I started bringing on people, outsourcing work, bringing on people who are in the area who are looking for jobs. And then I started expanding my, my clientele base. And then I also started pre-framing with my clients what it would be like to work with somebody who wasn't in their geographical area. Hmm. Cause I knew I would be moving. So I started talking to them and working with them as if I wasn't the business owner on state street who had the office and everything else. I really started framing that and setting all of those things up to make sure they worked too and make sure I could do this. Yeah. Th those are a lot of the th exact things that I did not do with one of my businesses, which led to problems, which is one of the reasons I do what I do now to help, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, people not make those problems, um, with, uh, you know, there's a difference between growing and scaling. And I sure. think some people don't understand that they, they think it's all the same thing and they use it interchangeably. It's like, no, if you aren't scaling, if you have the flu tomorrow, your business isn't growing. Yep. If you die tomorrow, your business isn't running, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I run across just, I think the word, it becomes so vanilla. I'm scaling a business. Well, are you though? Are you? <laughs> you know, then they post pictures and they're online and they're like, their, some loved one is in the hospital and they're like, I'm grinding away and they got their computer and they're doing I'm like, you're not scaling, man. You're no. not scaling. You'd be in the, you'd be present with your loved ones right now and someone else will be running it. Well, that, and that's the thing, man. I, you know, when you talk to people, what do you value most in life? What's the thing you value? What does everybody say? Relationships. Cool. Show me your calendar. 
<laughs> right? I'll show you your priorities. Show me your calendar. It's the first question I ask business owners. Yeah. When, I, when they tell me it's relationships, where are your kids? Where's your wife? Where's your husband? You know, who's, where are your friends? Uh, but you know, I'm going through this phase that you've been going through for 10 years. Um, you know, it's not a phase <laughs> at that point. And it's really sad. And I, you know, I was, I was going through it and I'm lucky I was young. Um, but at the same time to me, it was very real where my business owned me. I didn't own it. Yeah. You know, um, That's, I, I was, yeah, <laughs> we can all relate, right? Yeah, I'm at, cringing, at some level I'm cringing, you know, <laughs> cause I know, I know exactly what it's like. <laughs> oh, uh, it's like owner versus operator. There's all kinds of words that people are talking about, but yeah, I had that epiphany. And I think the difference between me then is I went for it and I went through that whole idea of, you know, and I had some people around me who passed away. So there were some, there were some triggers and levers there for me to have leverage, around that. And I, I kind of looked around and I was like, well, you know, crap, you know, is this the rocking chair test? You know, if I leave this business and I exit, you know, can I come back? Yes. I have the education, the experience. I can do this again. I'm, I've done it many times. I'm confident. And then, you know, geez, will I be mad at myself for giving this a shot? And the answer was a resounding. No, I wouldn't be mad at myself at all. I mean, the opposite, you know, if I'm sitting here grinding this out and working, and even if I scale it, you know, uh, my, my plan was to franchise my business model, my training studio. And, you know, at the time I thought it was a good plan looking back at it, not, uh, <laughs> but hindsight's 2020. Right. And, uh, yeah, once I hit the road for the first time and my business was, my businesses were doing better with me out of them than they were in, which is more often the case. Um, that's when I realized I'm like, man, I'm onto something. And I had people on social media just hitting me up left and right with this, I'm sure you've heard this a million times. I love what you're doing. I want to do that, but I can't because I have kids. I can't because I have a job. I can't because my car is red. You know, it's like whatever excuse <laughs> yeah, right. I could think of. And yeah, that's when I really started posting the things like we were talking about content. I started posting it more regularly, not for any other reason than I wanted people to just one thing to inspire them to take action and go for it. And there were a couple people in my family who were the reason I really started producing the content because I believe you don't coach your family, but if they read something and they took action, they found purpose and they actually, you know, they, you know, out of love, I want them to be fulfilled. I want them to go for it. And, um, you know, I wanted to kind of inspire them. So I started producing content and that's how that all came about. That's awesome. It's, it's, you mentioned, you know, there were some people who passed away. Uh, mm -hmm. in life. Uh, Tim Allison, who runs a podcast, Screw the Naysayers, he had me on uh, a few months ago. And we were talking about the same thing. He had had someone on his show, and I can't remember who it was, who said, you know, often, unfortunately, for people to make a change or to come to realization that they have to make a change, it takes it what he called an infrastructure rattling event, like either their own health or someone around them. Yeah. And it's unfortunate um, but I guess it's another reason you and I do what we do to try and get people to make that change to see past the, all right, I have a red car. I can't, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, whatever excuse it is. And we all have people, you know, I ask, um, some men usually, you know, they're making 250, 300,000 yep. and their marriage is suffering. They're overwhelmed. They're having anxiety attacks. They list all these things. And but they, they don't, okay, so how much do you want for your wife? How much money? They say, well, that's stupid. What are you saying? I'm like, okay, well, what's the one thing holding you back from making a change? Well, I got to keep my current salary. Well, what are you making? 250. All right, so 250 is the price you want for your wife. Oh, that's not fair. It's like, no, it totally is because you're making 250 now and you're miserable. <laughs> you're going to lose your wife. Your, your relationship sucks with your kids. Yep. Um, and still, you know, I, I, I get, I guess over time through a sales process, you, you want to get hardened to the people who don't jump in your program, but you're still, I'm sure you get the same way, frustrated and sad that you know this person is heading toward a cliff oh. and they won't put on the brakes until it, that cliff comes. Yeah. And sometimes they, they won't even put on the brakes when the cliff comes. Yeah. Right. Um, it's almost like they'll put on the accelerator because- for them, they've associated so much fear to that conflict or that change that they won't actually push forward to that next level. And you want to 
grab them <laughs> and almost strangle them, right? Um, you know, and you're like, look, I'm, you know, even if you don't, my whole thing is, and I, it's, yeah, it's, don't work with me. I don't care, right? Go work with somebody and be like, you have dreams and aspirations. You're miserable. You're not, con- like you said, you're not connected to your kids. It's going to cost you 50,000 plus dollars minimum, right? For this divorce you're about to have with right, this woman right. you still love, but you're too scared to make the change, right? You're too scared of the unknown. And I think that's really what it is, right? It's, yeah. it's the unknown that makes people not want to take that leap. What, how did you, so let me ask you if I can. Yeah. Yeah. How did you get, when did you make the switch and said, you know what, I'm going to move forward and, and really put my, my teachings out there, my learnings, and to bring people in and go into a coaching mentoring type business? So I, I had been having anxiety attacks for many years. And uh, my revenue was doing wonderfully and I was just miserable. It just was not, cause I didn't do some of the things, you know, I, it, it was all me. And, yeah. um, and I had a team and I tried to build scalability and some of my clients balked. And so I stood down when I should have pushed forward and said bye. And so, um, you know, my dad died and I realized I needed to make a change, but I still wouldn't do it. And I started coaching at that time cause people were like, listen, you've built your companies and you had freedom, but I didn't have fulfillment. And so I went on for years and it was a Thanksgiving week. It was Tuesday morning and I was supposed to be off that week and my clients knew it, but that didn't stop them from calling, bugging. Can you hop on this? Can you send us this? Can you send us that? And then the week later, I was supposed to go up for a meeting. We're in that same meeting a year before we got yelled at for an hour. It was 8.30 AM on a Monday. It was like 12 degrees. I had to fly in on Sunday for the meeting and we were all yelled at for being low energy, which we weren't <laughs> low energy, but even if we would, I, so I, I laid there in bed that Tuesday morning. I'm like, all my clients are calling me. I can't even take a week off. Uh, I'm supposed to fly to this meeting. And if I go to that meeting, and my plane goes down, like I'm not going out like that. And I just, I flipped a switch and that was it. And I said, I'm shutting it down. And I, listen, I went for the cliff and I waited for that cliff to come. And then I was backed into a corner because I shut down the agency overnight. Mm-hmm. And I listen, I had some savings and some other things, but I had to then my side hustle turned into my full-time gig overnight, which it's been wonderful. Awesome. But I try to tell people, build a landing strip. You don't have to do what I did. It's dumb. It's stupid. And people will try to argue with me. Oh, you're better for it. It's like, you, yes, okay, that's fine. But you know, I'm better for having a root canal too. take care of your teeth. So you don't have to have the root canal you know? <laughs> I'm better because I had a stent put in whatever. If you had lived healthier, you wouldn't have had to have the stent put in. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, that's how I ended up. Um, so, so you, you coach now, you do a lot of public speaking. Um, you coach entrepreneurs, business owners, or. Yeah, I don't do a lot of public speaking. Um, so oh, I, okay. I guess, I present at uh, retreats and conferences. So not like I'm not there on the, in the big stage or doing it. Like the biggest crowd I think I've spoken to is a little over a hundred people. Oh, got it. Okay. To give you an idea. I I don't feel I have a problem doing it, but then again, I've never been (laughs) in that situation. Sure. Um, You know, similar to, so you did a great thing on LinkedIn, which I saw on the TEDx, um, which I spun around. That's how I actually first got introduced to you. Uh, It was on LinkedIn that was posted in there. So okay, that would great. be the size audience that I would typically speak to. Got right? it. Okay. Yeah. To give you a frame of reference for those listening, you know, we're talking about 50 people to 25, 50 people. I don't know how many people were there. Um, the LinkedIn one, there was about a hundred. Okay. There well, so. there, but that was uh, probably 85, 85. Okay. We had a hundred pay and I think uh, 15 didn't show up, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. My average is, le- is 20 or less. <laughs> and are, they, are these your events and retreats or... Some of them are now. So, yeah. um, so I, I do coach exclusively business owners and entrepreneurs just because okay. that's what I know, yeah. right? I, I get it. I get the pain, the struggles, and I found a path and I was able to systemize that path out for the way that I look at it anyway. Um, so the retreats, I actually have a client of mine who was a one, I was coaching for one year who had a business, which is actually another coaching business, <laughs> uh, does men's retreats. And, uh, I bought into that business as a partner, business partner. Uh, I started going there presenting and then he approached me like, Hey, this is what we like to do. And, uh, yeah, so I go to those retreats and they're international. So we fly all over the world. 
cool. And men are coming off all in, all business owners again. So it's a perfect segue to what I was doing. And those are a lot of fun. And the other ones are in the fitness industry. Um, I speak at those events quite often because I still have a lot of ties in there. Uh, I told you I was an insatiable learner. I have 18 degrees and certifications in that field. Oh, wow. Um, I, I dive into things. <laughs> <laughs> I like learning. All yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, I do those kinds of events. And then um, I'll also do charity, a lot of charity speaking. So, for charitable organizations, uh, my agency, we used to give back every quarter. We'd pick a charity and then we would market for that charity with the idea we'd go in there and say, look, you need, your charity needs to be turned into a business so it's sustainable. Because, you know, these charities are going out there and they're, it, it's sad. I can go on a whole other tangent, but they're just relying on the end of your contributions and sure. you're not helping anybody. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're speaking to someone, an entrepreneur in their 20s, mm -hmm. who is kind of taken in by what, what I guess I'll call it grind porn, right? Yes. All the stuff, you know, the Grant Cardone, you know, work till you're dead you know, stay up. Um, Gary Vee. Yeah, yeah. Oh, although Gary Vee, I've noticed, depending on the video, sometimes says you don't have to work. And the other times, you know, sometimes he's Tim Ferriss, sometimes he's Grant Cardone, depending on the, you know, <laughs> I, I've noticed that. Um, but just, you know, use all your free hours to work. Um, and I'm not saying hard work is bad, but there's inputs versus outcomes, right? Oh, yeah. What, what would you tell that entrepreneur? One nugget um, of information. I, yeah, I would, I would say there's two things. One is people tell you to work hard and the other camp tells you to work smart. And I think uh, there's, you can do both. Yeah. Work hard when you're working smart. Um, and, but you can also, working hard can be done with flow and ease. And that's something I wish I would have known. I didn't know that in my 20s. And kind of, you know, you get in that flow state when you're doing what you love and you can always be in that state should you choose to. You learn the right mechanisms really work on your mindset. You know, yeah. I mean, really work on it. It's not a one and done. You don't go to the gym, you know, lift weights one time, come home, be ripped and say, you know what? That's it. I only had to go once. No, you, it's, it's the work that's put in day in, day out. Same thing with mindset, same thing with business, same thing with relationships. It's the consistency that gets you there. Um, and yeah. if, can I tell, can I tell one more thing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because <laughs> in case he's listening or she, um, is, you don't have to get there today. Hmm. You don't. Getting there sooner is not the reward. I've been to the top of the mountain, so to speak, and I can tell you it's the, it truly is the journey. And yeah, when you get there, you're going to set other goals and you're going to keep moving up. But enjoy that moment and don't try to rush it. You know, I, I certainly did. I had three companies, lived by the beach, but I never went to the beach, right? Uh, you know, just enjoy that time. Is. And that's, and that's to the 70 year old entrepreneur too. I would say the yeah. exact same thing. It's fun. You mentioned the gym and you know, all of us is depending on what gym you go to, but uh, especially more gym, some gyms more than others, you go there and there's guys who are there for two hours mm -hmm. and they claim they had a two hour workout and they're talking <laughs> and all they do is they go from thing to thing. They talk, they hit on women and it's yep. like, you just did 20 minutes of actual workout instead of you're saying you're doing two hours and it's still the same way. I did an AMA in 10 X last yep. week and there was an entrepreneur who said, and he was, he was the one brave enough to speak up. And he said, you know, I go to the office seven to nine hours a day. My dad told me that to be a man, you got to work eight hours a day. And, but I do it out of routine. I do it because of all, he named a number of inputs. He said, but I actually only get two or three hours of work done. He said, but what am I supposed to do? Go home and waste away? And I said, well, no, the problem is you haven't identified the other things in your life that give you fulfillment. Do you yeah. like going for a run? Do you like any type of sport, loved ones, physical activity, uh, read a book, whatever it is, you know, right? And, uh, but you're not actually working nine hours a day. You're working two hours a day and you're wasting the other six or seven or eight. So, so true. I mean, it, it, it's absolutely amazing. It's kind of that idea, like we've all, when you go on vacation, right? Hopefully the business owners go on vacation, but when you go, what, the day before the vacation or the two days before, you get more work done, you got done all week, right? right? That's because you're in a rush, you've set deadlines, you have a real deadline that you have to hit and you're able to produce. Um, and if you think about it, I think a lot of people, I know I did, when I look back at this and a lot of the business owners I talk to, is your identity is associated with that. 
Hmm. Right. Yeah. I used to tell everybody, you know, I could pull myself up by my bootstraps. I didn't ask for help. You know, I had mentors, but I would, I would do it. My, I would move my office, literally disassemble my desks, move by myself as a badge of honor. Right. How <laughs> stupid is right. that? Right. You know? yeah. <laughs> I can outgrind my competition. You know, that to me is ridiculous. You know, it's what is success to you? How do you set your vision? Do you have a vision for your life? And is your vision for your life staying in your office 40 hours a week? I mean, that's the majority of your life, right? If that's, you know, if that's what you want to do, go for it. But if you haven't sat down and actually written out what it is you truly want, then that's got to be step number one, because otherwise you're living into somebody else's dream. That's absolutely wonderful. And Doug, if people want to learn more about you, hire you, just get to know you, where's the best place they can find you online? Best place is my website, uh, DougHoltOnline.com. Doug Holt was taken. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to be pretty impressed if you had DougHolt.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's a politician now. Uh, he oh, beat really? me to okay. it. So, but yeah. Uh, so it's DougHoltOnline.com. And that's where I just blog, share my, my thoughts. And it gives you directions to all the companies I'm involved with and nonprofits. And uh, would love to gra grab a glass of wine with anybody and talk about life. Awesome. Well, Doug, thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Kurt. Absolutely. Absolutely.